Which brings us to the Kalabare Ijwa. And they hunted and fished in the eastern delta of the Niger River. These delta regions, of course, are particularly fertile. You're going to have a good hunting ground, good fishing grounds in these areas. And trade is going to be the cornerstone of their economy. Of course, they're on that eastern coast, or sorry, western coast of Africa. Trade organizations known as canoe houses would play a central role uh, to them. So this is an area based in trade, given where they are along the Niger River, which would act as a major highway, as well as along the coast, they're in a perfect position to focus on trade issues. And in this case, we're actually looking at these ancestral screens. Kalabari artists lavished attention on shrines to their ancestors, this idea of ancestor worship. And this is a unique form featuring elaborate screens made of wood, fiber, textiles, and other materials. It also leads to the reason why we don't see many of them, is when you look at those materials used, wood, and more specifically fiber and textiles, these are materials that tend to degrade very quickly over time. They might, might last 100 years in really prime preservation conditions, but they're not usually kept in those conditions. Oftentimes, these ancestral screens weren't meant to last more than a generation or two. So again, sort of a temporary form, so we're limited in terms of the pieces we can look at. Specifically, we're looking at one from the late 19th century, uh, and in this case, this is four feet tall, honoring a deceased chief of a trading corporation of one of these major canoe houses, or what are called canoe houses. And it would be displayed, similar to this, in the chief's house after they die. And looking at the piece, the chief in the center is holding a long, silver-tipped staff in his right hand and a curved knife in his left. The staff is probably a symbol of power, as is the knife. This is not that unusual. Some form of staff appears as a symbol of power in a great many societies around the world, and the idea of punishment in the form of a knife is not unusual. He's bare-chested, probably more a depiction of either power, muscular physical power, or simply traditional garb. The headdress is in the form of a sailing ship indicating success in trade. Now, by the late 19th century, he's trading with Europeans primarily. So that ship is something that would have been key to his existence and his power, seeing those ships come in. Every time they come in, he makes more wealth or becomes more powerful within the group. The attendants are smaller and flank him, showing again that sense of power. Not everyone has attendants, so it's something you show off. The heads of his slaves at the top, uh, sorry, the heads at the top are his slaves, the heads at the bottom are his conquered enemies. Now this is not unusual. Slaves are frequently simply depicted in bulk, in mass, and without individuality in art. We see it from the Romans, we see it in Asian art, and we see it here. Slaves are property, so it's a very different sort of concept of humanity. Whereas below, the heads of his enemies are symbolic here. This is probably a specific enemy that we're seeing on the right side. And that's not unusual. We see a lot of conquerors, images of conquerors, where they trod upon the bodies of their enemies, or their armies are walking upon the bodies of their enemies. And this goes back to prehistoric times, uh, both in Africa, but also throughout the world. The hierarchical composition and stylized anatomy, as well as facial features, are common in African art. But in this case, they're a little more exceptional. They're very obvious. So what we're seeing is called the hierarchy of scale. The most important person, in this case the chief, is the largest. And then we have the attendants. We know that this enemy 
was particularly important because his head is much larger than the other, also much larger than the slaves and the attendants. So according to hierarchy of scale, he is the next most important thing in the composition. If we lived at the time in the late 19th century and were familiar with this group, we would probably know who that is. The slaves, being the least important, have the smallest heads. So we're really getting into ideas that are global, that exist across art. And the idea of an ancestral screen and the idea of remembering an important ancestor is common. We see the same thing today. We remember our ancestors, maybe through pictures or graveyards or any number of different ways. In Africa, it takes on a little different role since people take strength from their ancestors, uh, pray to them, etc. But we see the same basic concept, looking back and worshiping those who brought power to your lineage, worshiping those who came before you.